see me, you Stevie. Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. What is up, Earth's Mightiest subscribers? It's Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, I'm going to be talking about Thunder, 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 Thundercats. Oh, number three, written by Declan Shalvey with art by Drew Moss and color by Martina Pignadoli. So in this issue, Lino is still sprung on Calica. There is no doubt about it. His nose is wide open to all the smells and pheromones that Calica is sending his way right now. It's almost like springtime in Bambi. He's Twitter-pated. There's nothing you can do to stop him. But there is one person who is not smelling what Calica is cooking, and that's Panthro. And we kind of already knew this from the previous issue, but the tension between Panthro and Lino boils over this issue. And this is heartbreaking stuff to see because at the end of the day, we know Panthro is right to be suspicious about Calica. We saw that she very clearly has something going on with her. She doesn't really have a story that adds up to anything and it's just something's not right about her. Not to mention, we also have the benefit of seeing that Mumra seems to be exerting some level of influence over her. So there's also that. So yeah, Panther's very correct to not trust her at all. But at the same time, we also know why Lionel was so eager to want to keep Calico around. And it's because, gotta remember, he's a kid trapped in a man's body and he's feeling things. He's kind of in a roundabout way going through a little bit of early puberty, more or less. And he's feeling all the feelings. And right now there's no one he feels he can connect with on any level that he wasn't already you know, sharing some kind of familial role with. Case in point, his closest friends, Wiley Cat and Wiley Kit, well, they're still the same age that they were before they got on the shuttle that got them away from Thundera into Third Earth. So right now, he doesn't have any of his close friends. And of course, while there is Tigra and Chitara, they're like uncles and aunts to him more than they are anything else. And Panthro, kind of the same, almost more like an uncle and uh, an elder statesman for him to look up to. So, I mean, yeah, it makes a great deal of sense why he's kind of angling in this direction to want to have a connection with someone who he doesn't really know all that much. And Calica is eating it up. She is manipulating him in all the right ways and turning two of the most important Thundercats against one another. Panthro as the general of the Thundercats and Lionel as the lord of the Thundercats. So yeah, this is right up her alley. She is literally doing all the right things right now at least to get what she wants. But what is amazing in this is that we get to see a little taste of old Thundarian tradition. We get to see the Thunder Duel take place in this issue. And while I don't really wanna talk about the outcome of the Thunder Duel, because I feel that is something that if you're reading this book, you should probably see how that plays out for yourself because it's done very well. But the long and short of it is that because Panthro does not trust Lionel's judgment right now, he, is just unloading on Lionel, letting him absolutely have it, even going as far as to striking Lionel, knocking him into the damn dirt. But all that aside, Chitara is the one who's taking Lionel's side, and she challenges Panthro to the Thunder Duel. Now, the Thunder Duel is about roughly what it sounds like. It is a way for the Thundercats to settle disputes amongst themselves. But the thing I like about how this works is that it doesn't matter what rank someone is. Like, to be fair, Chitara is not on the same level as Panthro. Panthro is, for all intents and purposes, he is the second in command to Lionel. Chitara is underneath him in that regard. But despite the fact that she is lower in rank than Panthro, the Thunder Duel allows her to challenge him if she feels he's wrong about something. And the interesting part about this, and this is kind of where, while the Thunder Duel is a really interesting concept, it's a cool concept, but it's also a concept that is meant to have some holes in it, it feels like. And I don't, I don't know, maybe this was or was not Declan's aim here, but I do definitely feel like it's one of those deals where it's set up in such a way that regardless of who wins or loses, even if the person who lost is right, they are in a position where they have to just 
let it go and you go along with the person who was wrong no matter how wrong they were if they won the duel then they are therefore correct or, or not even so much that they're correct but just you're gonna go with it and i like this because it puts this whole calica deal into a position where the stakes are just that much higher because at this point panther doesn't just have to win because he believes he's right he has to win because we the readers know that he's right now that said getting back to the duel itself the interesting part about it is lino is exempt from being able to challenge anyone and that makes sense because he is the lord of the thundercats why would he challenge anyone like he doesn't have to he is the leader they have to do what he says it does seem like it allows the lower ranked thundercats to challenge him or at the very least challenge for him in some case or another because you know clearly that's what chitara does in this but yeah it's, it's interesting i like it it's uh it's not something that i feel like you even really have to think too hard about uh you just gotta just go with it i just think it's cool that the thundercats can freely challenge one another without having to worry about you know, rank being pulled and while i don't know if this is a hard rule or not but it seems like the person Person who is challenged is allowed to dictate the location and the nature of the duel because since Chitar is the one that challenges him panther is very quick to say i choose the place and how we do this and it goes from there and winning the duel is ultimately dictated by who gets knocked down like it's not a matter of pinning anyone's shoulders or making someone yield it's all about who can be knocked off their feet and onto their back, which is kind of similar to how some animals assert dominance in certain instances. So it's, it all tracks. Now, all of this aside, Snarf has been oddly absent from the first two issues of Thundercats, but here we get the thing I feel that was the best and most welcome change that Declan could have made to the story of the Thundercats. And one that I feel is pretty damn welcome. That change is the Snarf does not talk like at all. Snarf not talking is a huge departure from the original series. And I'm not the biggest fan of Snarf, but I'm also not the biggest Snarf hater either. Like, honestly, Snarf is one of those characters I can take or leave, but I would be lying to you if I said that he wasn't annoying. He is an incredibly annoying character, but I don't hate him as much as some others might. And I think that's honestly a pretty uncontroversial thing to think about Snarf is that he's annoying. Unless there's the one person out there in the world who actually likes Snarf uh, and, and loves everything he says. I'm not that person, obviously. To be fair, Snarf does talk, but he talks in a way that's a little bit different than what you might be used to. If you go back to my interview with Declan Shalvey and Drew Moss, which if you didn't see it, it's up here. You can go check it out. It's pretty awesome, great conversation. The thing that becomes very clear in that interview is that Declan and Drew are taking a lot of nods from the original Thundercats animated series from the 1980s. They aren't really taking anything from the 2011 series. As a matter of fact, Declan has gone on record to say that he has not really watched it. <laughs> so he didn't want to use anything from that to uh, you know, taint the vision he had for this, which he wanted something that was more in line with the original cartoon but in doing that i i actually wonder and i don't think this actually came up in the interview but it's something i have talked about on the blurred cave with carter is that i wonder if just in absence of not watching the 2011 series if maybe just maybe he did wind up doing something even coincidentally that was similar to that cartoon and what he's done is that in the 2011 thundercat series snarf didn't talk either as a matter of fact, the way the Snarf communicated with Lino was just simply through the fact that they had an incredibly deep bond that allowed them to kind of empathically know what the other one was trying to say, even if they couldn't actually hear the words. In this series, Snarf does something very similar. It's not an empathic connection, but it is implied that they can communicate without actually talking to one another. It does seem to come across that way at the very least before we learn how Snarf really communicates with Lino, and it's that he uses telepathic communication. He can speak with Lino and only Lino through telepathic communication. And it's also funny that this comes up this way because this is also how Calica almost slips up because it's revealed that the other Thundercats cannot hear him. They can't hear what Snarf is saying. Lino is basically parroting back whatever Snarf says to him 
to everyone else. But this is something that's probably gonna come back to bite Calica in the ass uh, somewhere down the road because she has ultimately slipped up in revealing that somehow, some way, she heard Snarf before, but doesn't understand him now, which makes you wonder what exactly is going on there. As for everything else going with Calica, we still don't know exactly what's up with her. We don't know exactly what the nature of her character is, but clearly it's something to do with Mumra. We don't really know the full breadth of it, but it definitely seems like something's not on the up and up. We don't know how she's connected to Mumra in whatever way, but we do know she is angling to keep Lino under her thumb for as long as humanly possible. As for Slythe, that is another story. He's busy right now with fellow mutant Monkeyan. And Monkeyan is an interesting addition here because he's one of those characters who's always kind of like the dim-witted lackey who might sometimes be smarter than he appears, but is still at the end of the day, a dim-witted lackey. And here he seems to be getting a similar treatment to Slythe, whereas Slythe in the original cartoon was you know, not the most threatening character. I mean, he was supposed to be, but I mean, you just knew you didn't have to take Slythe incredibly seriously. You knew it was either Mumra or Bust you know, when it came down to the Thundercats facing off against their foes. So yeah, you just knew. And Monkeyan was even less threatening than Slythe. But here, Monkeyan seems to be a little bit more of, I won't say a cerebral assassin, but definitely someone who could give Slythe the run for his money. And while in the original animated series, they weren't necessarily enemies so much as Monkeyan just didn't like the way Slythe ran the show. And sometimes he would talk a little spicy under his breath. Slythe would you know, basically come in and be like, hey, what you say to me? And you know, Monkey would walk it back or just say whatever it was he said and then move on with it and do exactly what Slythe told him to do. But here things are a little bit different. Monkey in here is definitely someone who is maybe not necessarily capable of taking down Slythe, but he's definitely interested in trying. And we also notice here that, well, in this comic, Slythe is the master of the mutants of Plundar. Here, Monkey in declares himself as the master of the mutants of Third Earth. This is a departure here because in the original animated series, Monkeyan was not the leader, master, or even the custodian of the mutants of Third Earth. He was the master and lord of the other Monkeyans. He was not leader of the other mutants. That was Slide's gig. So we're getting a little bit of a change up here. So basically Monkeyan is being elevated up some. So definitely here for it. Now, getting to the Mumra and Jaga situation, we still have no answers there, but something is clearly up with Jaga. He's been corrupted somehow. His essence seems to be all over the place. He's not the elder statesman mentor force ghost style character you might be more familiar with. There's something deeper, a deeper narrative going on with Jaga and even something that just, you know, and you know, once again, I may be reading too much into this, but I feel like Drew Moss wouldn't have put it here in the issue if it wasn't the case, but Mumra seems to be a little thrown off by how Jaga's acting just in the handful of panels we see Jaga and Mumra in this issue. While at first he seems like he's very much on board with talking cash money smack to Jaga, eventually Jaga proves that he might just be a little bit more than what Mumra is willing to deal with. You guessed it, obligatory channel outro time. If you're not subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. Clicking that subscribe button and tapping that notification bell ensures that you get more videos just like this one and you don't miss any of my other content that I drop throughout the week, plus my live streams every Thursday and Saturday. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure you click that like button, keep it plus ultra, and sound off in the comments.